Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to ELPC Thinks with Congressman Mike Quigley. Uh, I'm Howard Lerner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental Law and Policy Center, and ELPC Thinks is where we bring together political leaders, experts, environmental leaders, and community partners to help figure out new strategies for achieving progress. And a quick heads up, uh, we're gonna be recording this webinar and streaming it live on Facebook to share with people who weren't able to join us this morning, right? Today, we are honored to have with us my friend, Congressman Mike Quigley of the Illinois Fifth Congressional District. Uh, Mike Quigley is a lifelong environmentalist. He's been a strong advocate for climate change solutions, known Congressman Quigley for a long time and environmental concerns, solutions, challenges have been part of what the Congressman has been doing for almost his entire career, which is really terrific. This isn't a Johnny come lately. Mike Quigley has been an environmental leader throughout his career. <clears throat> Congressman Quigley has risen to become chair of the House Appropriations Subcommittee for Financial Services and Good Government. I'm sorry, general government, but good government too <laughs> under subcommittee chair oh, Quigley. <clears throat> And let's think about it. <clears throat> the House Appropriations Committee is the most powerful committee in the House. Uh, the subcommittee chairs are referred to as the College of Cardinals. Uh, Congressman Quigley is a cardinal and is rising up through appropriations, chairing subcommittees. That makes a huge difference for the Chicago metropolitan area and throughout the Midwest and the country. Uh, Congressman Quigley also serves on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, which as we all understand is even more important today than we might have even thought about a few years ago. He's vice chair also of the House Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. That's a group that's committed to combating climate change and assuring a robust low carbon economy. So today we're looking to hear from Congressman Quigley about his vision, his environmental priorities in Congress. Thank you, Congressman. Welcome. I'm glad you could join us today. And let's start off by hearing just a little bit about how did you become involved in environmental issues? How did you become concerned about the environment? Why did you make it a priority for what you do in Congress? You know, it's interesting. I was talking to some teachers yesterday and we want to blame them for everything. Uh, so uh, I'll give them credit. Uh, when I was a freshman in high school, I had a teacher at Glenbard North High School in biology. And uh, he gave me uh, the book, The Population Bomb by a Stanford professor, Dr. Paul Ehrlich. And uh, it scared the hell out of me. But for four years, he mentored me on working these issues. It's funny, if someone can say something to you in one conversation that you remember for 50 years, he said, uh, uh, don't let anyone tell you that you can't save the world. You can and you have a moral responsibility to try. Corny as hell, but this place, I'm in DC now, but this place needs corny. Uh, you know, I get asked, do you watch House of Cards? And I said, I, I live House of Cards. <laughs> so why the hell do I want to watch it? I need Frank Capra. I need West Wing. I need teachers who, uh, you know, who preach and teach. And, uh, you know, that's what worked for me. And then there was this slow evolution of figuring out how the hell... <clears throat> you get in a position where you can actually try to save the world. So, you know, some of that was where I went to school, what I was trying to do. And then uh, our, our friend, Mary Gady, helped me get an internship and then a job at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Region 5 Air Programs. And uh, uh, when Ronald Reagan became President Reagan, uh, our program shifted from transportation planning to uh, regulatory reform. In other words, we were trying to help them circumvent the Clean Air Act. So it was probably the lowest ranking staff person in the history of the US EPA. I, I quit in protest <laughs> because I wasn't going to work for somebody who did that. Uh, recently, uh, during the Trump administration, I would get a chance to speak to EPA employees and I would say, don't do that. You know, we need you. Uh, and we certainly do. And then from there, I quit to start running campaigns for people who I thought were great on the environment. 
And I guess one of the big themes was every position can be an environmental position, right? Whether you're an alderman, a state rep, uh, a county commissioner, uh, you work on a library board, they can do green and sustainable things. And that's what I tried to do from, from that point on. Hell, when I worked for uh, Alderman Hansen, you may remember we did the uh, moratorium on new landfills in Chicago. I mean, that changed the future of whole neighborhoods in Chicago and, and really the way that we look at uh, waste disposal and recycling. So, you know, it, it just from then it's take any position you have and try to make it uh, something that does uh, good work on sustainability. And for 10 years, you know, they said, well, how are you going to do that at the county board? Well, we, we passed the cutting edge bird safe bill, mandatory recycling, um, green buildings. It's the first really green, you know, building ordinance of significance by a major government in the country. We were called the greenest local elected official in the country, which was nice. I don't know if it was true, but you know, it was just a theme toward mo moving in that direction. And then on a November night in 2008 in Grant Park with 300,000 of our closest friends, President Obama had gotten elected. Uh, the rumor was that somebody named Rahm Emanuel was moving on to be chief of staff to the president. And someone said, so what are you gonna do? So uh, we ran and we were lucky enough to win uh, a seat in Congress and we're almost 13 years here. So, you know, it's a, a lifelong sense of how important it is. I was honored to teach the environmental policy for 10 years at Loyola University. Um, so it is built upon that and the challenges are obviously greater than they were even those days when I was scared to death reading Paul Ehrlich's book. Uh, I guess the modern day version for some would be uh, an inconvenient truth. Whatever it takes to get people active, Use it to the best way you can. All right. So let's look back and then look forward. This is your seventh term in Congress. Talk a little bit about some of the big wins you've had. And then looking forward, you know, what are your priorities going into the next Congress? You know, I would say the biggest win, uh, one of the biggest wins we've had here was the infrastructure bill. And I know folks were upset with it about different things, but, you know, where we go with electric vehicles, uh, Senator uh, Duckworth from uh, Chicago, Illinois, did a great deal with uh, clean water, wastewater issues that are gonna be there. Uh, we're going to need infrastructure dollars uh, in an extraordinary way. And the way we do infrastructure to uh, address sustainability and withstanding climate change is going to be absolutely critical. It's a, it's, I'm saying it was a little underrated from a sustainability point of view. There's a lot of things in there to get us cranked up on electric vehicles and, and clean water and you know many more things. Obviously, we've got to pass Build Back Better, which would, would do so much more. And that's, you know, that's a massive priority. And it, the thing is, it's, it's doable if folks would, would uh, help carve out the necessary uh, you know, processes to, to move it along. But then, you know, look, I think this has to be what it always is here in DC. Uh, you know, aspiration meets practicality. But I, and I think you can't do one without the other. You know, uh, we can't let perfect be the enemy of great or really, really good on a lot of things. I'm on the, uh, uh, every major piece of green legislation uh, in Congress right now. And, uh, you know, they're all priorities to an extent. I will say this, I mean, I'm a sponsor of reducing waste in national parks, which is something that we need to codify. We did it under the Obama administration. Uh, you remember on plastic, we, we got rid of micro beads. That was a, a victory. Um, I'm also the sponsor of the big cat bill, which is an animal, a humane animal thing, but it's also addressing issues of uh, extinction as does the Preventing Future Pandemics Act. We wanna do birds safe here, um, and a number of other things. I, I will point out that uh, one of the things that we did here as part of the SEEK caucus was uh, we've now gone to 
six national parks. This is a congressional delegation that I have led six times, beginning with Rocky Mountain, where we bring members of Congress and, and great environmental organizations from the country. And, and we talk about what climate change is doing to national parks to tr you know, try to speak to it to a broader audience. But who doesn't like national parks? It, it cuts down a lot of barriers. Our first one was the you know, Rocky Mountain and there, besides seeing the gray skeletons on whole mountainsides where the beetle has wiped out trees because of climate change, we were at the headwaters of the Colorado. And we were live streaming out, talking about the differences in just a few degrees and what that means in changing from snow as precipitation to rain, how much is retained and what it means to the Colorado River, obviously so essential to its environment, but also to the multitude of states that use it. And at that moment, President Trump announced that we were withdrawing from uh, the Paris Accord. So if we're going to talk about priorities, I, I, one of the main stresses that your viewers here are very aware of is everything's connected and environmental policy is foreign policy and vice versa. Uh, you know, this president is reversing that path where we are engaging with the world as we should. We need to help all countries uh, address the issues of climate change and sustainability and the ravages of, of climate change. So, uh, Look, we went to the Florida Everglades. We were just in Acadia. We were just in the, one of the newest national parks in Indiana. So we want to do this on the local level too and help people understand what climate change is doing to their forest preserves, park districts, et cetera. So Good. there's a long list. <laughs> well, you've done a lot. You know, interestingly, you were talking about protecting the national parks and climate change. You've also stepped up to help protect the Upper Mississippi River National Wildlife and Fish Refuge, the gem of the national wildlife system in the Midwest, fourth most visited in the country. Uh, these are things, national parks, national wildlife refuges, public lands issues that aren't always the highest priority for an urban suburban uh, house member like you. So why is that? What drives you on that? Just what yeah, you know, when I first became a county commissioner, uh, I had heard that REI wanted to become a sponsor of the forest preserves, and they were rejected. You know, this is 22 years ago. You know, we weren't thinking. Um, if we just think of national parks as something for folks in the suburbs or uh, rural areas to visit, but not for inner city people. It, it's just a horrible mistake besides leaving them out of something so precious. We have to keep reminding everyone that everything's connected, all right? That the urban environments and things like urban flooding are absolutely critical. <clears throat> and you should care about that if you live on Dearborn Street or if you live in Waukegan or if you live in Freeport, Illinois or in North Dakota. So the idea was to you know, you watch the uh, Burns National Park series, you begin to appreciate just how bipartisan their popularity is. And uh, obviously, you know, it doesn't have to be a national park. It can be the area you just talked about or forest or state parks or, or just local park districts. So the effects are there, but enjoying it is there as well. So we rec I guess the answer is we recognize just how important they are to everyone. And so that's why we have to remind them that, you know, the Morton Arboretum isn't insulated from this. And if you care about your, your walks through that beautiful area, you know, you should care just as much and act. And, and I guess finally is reminding people that their individual actions influences this, which is one of the reasons, you know, we were addressing you know, banning the sale of plastic water bottles, single-use plastic water bottles in our national parks, you know, making that connection with folks that this stuff hits home. But uh, you, you and uh, the LPC should be commended. That the major victory you just had this week, uh, it, it, it's a team, but <laughs> you guys were the leading part of that. So I'm very proud to have helped in whatever minor way we could. Uh, you know, the work's never done, but the work you do is absolutely critical. Thank you. 
and thank you for your help. And we'll be coming back to you on that. By the way, what's up with the undercover congressman you've been doing for several years? Um, I joined you a couple of years ago when you went to the Southeast side to check out the pet coke piles. Um, where has the undercover congressman gone recently? Yeah, it's stymied a little bit because of COVID, but COVID, we've done 93 different things. Think of Studs Terkel's book, Working, right? Where he, he interviewed people, uh, every, everyone from uh, people who park cars to school teachers to professional athletes. You know, we wanted to get a little better understanding of what life is like for folks and what they face and what their issues are. So, you know, we learned a lot as a sanitation worker as room service, as a person who cleans hotel rooms, works in a lot of restaurants, works in a foundry, uh, goes out and addresses the, the climate change issues and the people working on that. So you just spend a day with them and understand what the issues are. When you're in DC, you can get very, very isolated. And, uh, you know, people return your calls and you have a a wealth of information, but uh, it is not the same as going out in the national parks and seeing firsthand. It's not the same as uh, working day to day with people in their everyday jobs, beginning to understand what uh, those jobs are for them and why they matter. So uh, we're hoping after this variant clears up that we can start going back out there and working on, you know, we were in an emergency room for a day uh, we, you know, worked in uh, healthcare areas, so we're going to go back to the same sorts of things with a lot of climate change focus. Uh, when the infrastructure bill starts to get implemented and they start putting it, putting in these electric charging stations, we want to be there to remind folks what what's going on, but anything right. and everything related to infrastructure. And let me say this, if you care about any issue particularly the environment, particularly climate change. You got to think about watching everything the Appropriations Committee does, right? Nothing happens without dollars, right? The Department of Interior, if they don't have the resources they need to protect our, our national parks, uh, wh whatever good intentions they have are, are basically useless. The US EPA, the Justice Department, when they enforce environmental regulation, appropriations are the ball game, right? It's, it's the checkbook. So my theme is uh, every position can be a sustainability position. It just not, it can be, it just absolutely must be. So uh, there'll be a change in the next Congress, Mr. Price, uh, who's the chairman of the subcommittee that funds Transportation, housing, and urban development is stepping down. Uh, I am next in seniority, and I will, as they say, ascend to that spot. And here's what, just an example. When you're funding transportation, a few years ago, when my friends across the aisle were in charge, uh, their focus was roads and bridges, because they said that's the most important thing. My response is, they're important, but we have to build infrastructure for the next hundred years, not the last hundred years, right? You have to think ahead. Hell, during the depression, FDR electrified rural America, changed the world for them. Uh, Eisenhower came back from Europe and the war and he, he built the interstate highway system. Now, the equivalent of that, you might say, is making sure that the digital divide becomes no divide at all, or that everything we do is done in a sustainable fashion. All our infrastructure projects are, are built with that in mind. But we also, if we re when we rebuild Lakeshore Drive, that, that it is pedest more than pedestrian friendly, head friendly, et cetera, et cetera. Everything we do when it comes to that needs to be thinking about funding the next hundred years and making sure that the, the world is still around the hundred years after that. It has to be focused. And also it funds every housing, do that committee funds every housing dollar in the country. You know what that means for sustainability and housing and the That's education huge. opportunity. And, and finally, 
transportation, housing, urban development. <clears throat> urban development is in the eyes of the beholder or better yet, the chairman. So I want to fund all those projects that deal with urban flooding and all the other issues that come with the challenges we face and in a manner that's uh, got the, the concepts of sustainability, not as an afterthought, but ingrained in the process and the planning and the engineering. And with, you know, in, you know, our plan is to work with you and the others that are watching this and all the other entities and educators looking at this so we don't look back and say, hey, we should have done this. You know, we need folks with creativity and imaginations. Look, you're being in a position to chair that House Appropriations Subcommittee is a tremendous opportunity. I mean, let's, let's face it, the amount of good you can do there in terms of sustainability, alleviating poverty, solving problems for people in Chicago and people in the suburbs is just terrific. Um, two more quick questions for you, yeah. because then I know we have a bunch of people who have Q&A for you. Um, yeah. You're on the House Intelligence Committee, which is remarkable and I greatly respect. Can you tell us just a little bit about that experience? You know, or what can you tell us? Because I know a lot of that is strictly yeah, I mean, confident. Imagine part of your job where you go down in the bowels of uh, the house and get briefed three or four times a day on stuff where you you uh, you lose sleep, but it's absolutely critical, uh, particularly now. Uh, the good news is that with uh, Adam Schiff as chairman, uh, as I said, everything is connected. Um, we had the first public hearings about the intelligence community's input on climate change and what it does to the world. They're absolutely fascinating discussions about what climate change, climate change can do and is doing to uh, issues of political stability, um, military readiness, and, and a whole slew of other things. So uh, it's absolutely critical to our national security. Uh, Director Ray from the FBI said that uh, you know, national security, domestic security threats have now surpassed international ones. So, you know, <laughs> it, it, uh, it uh, keeps us busy, obviously. You know, people can probably see uh, over your right shoulder, the hockey net, a uh, couple of hockey sticks and so forth in your office. I, I heard you were at the White House today for a bill signing awarding a congressional gold medal uh, honoring Willie O'Ree, who sometimes is called the Jackie Robinson of hockey, because he was the first African-American player in the NHL. You know, that's just special. Yeah, um, let me give you a quick tour. Uh, yeah. Behind me is my regular old beat up Schwinn bike. Most of, vast majority of my trips in DC are walking or by bike. Behind that is Wrigley Field seats to make me feel at home, a hockey net. <laughs> some, some members have, um, Putting greens. Uh, I still play hockey because I'm a glutton. On the other side is the e-bike. It is it is a prop, but we actually use it uh, a great deal. So uh, again, you know, individual action matters, but leading by example is even more important. A quick you know, note: today was just the uh, speaker signing the Willie O'Ree bill. It then goes to the Senate. They'll sign it. Uh, the president will sign it soon. Oh, Willie O'Ree is an awesome guy. Uh, still with us. Again, he broke the color barrier. He played hockey for 22 years with, with the fact that he was blind in one eye. Wow. So uh, that may be the most remarkable thing uh, is said about him, uh, even the, wow. above the abuse he took uh, as the first Black to play in the NHL. You know, there's a caucus of members for just about everyone and everything in Congress these days. How about for uh, 60 year old hockey players, Cubs fans? Yeah. So, someone asked me if, if I'm a good hockey player. I said, well, it depends on what group you're talking about. I said, among 60 year old United States congressmen, uh, I'm the best in the world, but uh, that's a very small, small. That's a small sample size, small as sample the data size. scientist's son would say. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love it. I think it's great you're still playing. Hey, a couple of questions people have for you. Some of them are quick and some of them yep. take more. Um, questions lightning about, round. Yeah, lightning round. People have had really good experience working with Max Frankel when he was on your staff. Yeah. Uh, who's replaced Max? Yeah, Charlie Chamis has. Uh, he's got massive shoes to fill. But, we're, you know, Char uh, Max uh, headed our uh, delegations to the national parks. Um, Charlie's doing a lot of that. Uh, Jessica from my office is taking a large, probably the most dramatic part of the green sustainability issues. Uh, she, we brought her in from our Chicago office. <clears throat> so they'll get to know her. She's just an uh, extremely smart, hardworking person. So between the two of them on, on those issues, exactly how those roles are divided, uh, you know, they're gonna sort out. But uh, Charlie's my new LD to replace Max there. And uh, Jessica will be taking the lion's share of, of the sustainability issues and you know, many of the green issues. Charlie works a lot on the approach stuff as well. Uh, Allison Jarris, my chief, will uh, quarterback the whole thing uh, and obviously very well. So, you know, Max went on to do uh, other things uh, in the same area and we wish him well. Um, the Hill is run by smart young people. It's one of the things that gives me hope. You know, a couple of people speaking of hope uh, asked about your comment earlier about Build Back Better maybe being split into some parts, the, the attempt to move the climate piece forward. What's your prognosis? How do you think that's going to work? You know, anyone says that they have a crystal ball into the actions of the Senate. What they're really looking at is a black bowling ball, the old style. Uh, you know, honestly, it, it's a short walk from where I am to the Senate, but sometimes I feel like it could be in another world or another universe. It, it's, uh, you know, and if, if we had a hard time and I never give up dealing with voters' rights, which are the most important rights. All other rights really lay on the foundation of people being able to vote. You know, if, if that gets stymied, it's, it's, it's tough to see how we're going to move forward on other sustainability issues um, and all the other great issues and build back better. Obviously, the climate change issues in there matter a lot to me, but, you know, I still wish and, and fervently hope we can get things like child tax credit done and uh, a whole slew of critical issues there. Uh, let's hope. Uh, Susan Thomas had a question about how do we hold industry along the lakefront in Northwest Indiana and Illinois accountable to follow the environmental laws? You know, toxic spills becoming regular events. Yeah. Northwest Indiana, the Southeast side. Yeah. Full I mean, look, there's there's two bits of good news. Uh, yeah. uh, Deb Shore is the new regional administrator for the US EPA. In my life, I can't imagine finding somebody better to take that role, who, as most people know, was a, a cutting edge member of the MWRD, the Water Reclamation District, who gets water issues as well as anyone, but also understands how to get things done has a very good relationship with the members of Congress here. Um, and we have a, a Biden uh, Justice Department, right, to enforce these laws. So, uh, and we have a, at least another year, we know we're in the majority here on appropriations to give all those entities the resources they need to get this job done. So it's well past the time for those of us who, uh, who uh, recognize how all, all on this call, certainly, uh, just how precious Lake Michigan is and how irresponsible many of our uh, industrial partners have been. Right. There are a whole bunch of questions about uh, the ban on single-use plastic bags, including some exemptions for heavier weight bags, some questions about nuclear power, questions about the Supreme Court, uh, I know you only have a minute or two left, so let me just cue that up and any comments you want to make on those. Yeah, look, I, I think that uh, one of the things we could do is you could forward the questions from the individuals. We can get some of those responses back. And one of them that 
you know, I didn't touch on because it's hard to do in a short period of time. One of Max's uh, legacies is he put together two extraordinarily important bills dealing with the, the electrical grid system, right? Making it more efficient uh, from a absolutely critical as we move forward and as part of our uh, infrastructure package that that's done in a coherent fashion. We are not going to have uh, sustainable energy in this country if it's not delivered in a sustainable way. So we can put together sort of uh, uh, an info package on that, shoot it to you to shoot out to other folks. And if you give us those questions, we can go into more detail. And as time goes on, uh, we can post our office and our contact, they can reach us directly. And again, right. uh, you know, we have a, an office in the district, but in DC, uh, you know, Allison's the chief, Charlie's our new LD, replacing Max there, and uh, Jessica's going to handle a lion's share of all our green and sustainable issues. We'll make sure that we send the questions in the chat to Jessica so that she can go over them with you. Look, um, I'm going to thank you for the great work you're doing as a congressman, but really thank you for the great work you've done as a county board member and that you did starting at the aldermanic office with Bernie Hansen. And let's hope going forward, you can continue keep doing the great stuff you're doing. It's a pleasure, Mike, to work with you. If there's anything further that the Environmental Law and Policy Center and our many good colleagues here can do to help achieve our shared goals, just let us know. Yeah, we'd be lost without you. Thank you for your work. The last thing I want to say before I sign up and, and run the, <clears throat> to get home is, uh, there's a lot of defeatism and pessimism uh, that I see now. It doesn't help. Uh, I've played hockey since I was seven. Uh, I didn't say well, but I've played hockey since I was seven. But I never entered a game thinking, oh, we're going to get creamed and have things go well. So there's so much to look forward to and so much to be optimistic about. It's, uh, it's important now more than ever to be upbeat and remind ourselves of the good things that we've accomplished recently. So uh, uh, we appreciate that very, very much. Welcome. I was a lousy hockey player, a pretty good basketball player. And I share your view of, we need to be ambitious and focus on getting things done. The glass is more than half full and let's focus on that of how we make it fuller rather than you know, spend our time focusing on how empty it is sometimes, which it is. So thank you for what you're doing. And Thanks, thank everyone. you everybody for joining us. See you soon. Take care now. Bye now.